Welcome to another episode of the Safe Schools Rainbow Roundtable. I'm your host, Dr. Dan Sheridan, a licensed psychologist, and today we delve into a topic that affects all of us, but is especially critical for our young learners navigating the digital landscape, misinformation and media literacy. In this age of information overflow, knowing how to differentiate between facts and falsehoods online is a vital skill. Today's episode titled Decoding the Web, A Student's Guide to Identifying Misinformation Online will guide our young learners through the maze of misinformation and equip them with the tools to discern truth from fiction. Our panelists today come from a range of professional fields, including information science, media education, journalism, and most importantly, our students. They will share their knowledge, experiences, and offer practical advice on how to critically engage with online information. But before we move on, let's take a moment to meet our fantastic panelists for today's program. This is Dr. Maria Elena Villar. She's a professor of communication at Northeastern University. Welcome, Dr. Villar. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background? Yeah, I'm originally from Puerto Rico, but I lived in South Florida for 25 years. So this really feels like home. And I just recently um, moved up to Boston and um, and that's been a, an interesting experience so far. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. This is Tiffany Williams. She's a well-known social media influencer and host to the popular <laughs> streaming television show, Tiffany Explains It All. And we announced today that the show will be broadcast by the Happening Out television network, on Roku and Apple TV. Welcome, <laughs> Tiffany. Hi, I'm so happy to be here and getting to have these really important conversations. Absolutely, thank you for joining us. No, thank you for having me. <laughs> this is Harold Marrero. He's a pastor and Safe Schools Chief Operating Officer. Welcome, Harold. Thank you for um, being here. I'm happy to be here with you all. And you know, this is Safe Schools' second uh, Rainbow Roundtable. We did the first one here a couple of months ago. And we're so happy to be doing this again and this, you know, covering this all this important information. So thank I'm you, Harold. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> and we have Gabby Perez. She's the assistant director of the Butler Center for Service and Leadership at the University of Miami. Welcome, Gabby. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really excited to talk today about media literacy and how it affects our students and how we can help um, our students better navigate the world. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Gabby. And this is Steve Rothhaus. With more than 30 years at the Miami Herald, he was a journalist and part of the Pulitzer Prize winning, t winning team. Thanks, Steve, for joining us. It's, it's great being here. Um, I spent uh, almost 35 years at the Herald as a reporter, and but for more than 20 years, I covered LGBTQ. So uh, basically, it was a beat that no one else was doing uh, anywhere, and the Herald really led, it, led the way in the kind of coverage which basically brings us to today to being here and having these kinds of conversations. Absolutely. Thank you, Steve. So we've set the stage for today's discussion and met our wonderful panelists. Now let's dive deeper into our theme. Let's travel back in time to understand the roots of our topic and its evolution over the years. So let's kick off our journey into the fascinating world of media literacy and the fight against misinformation. Remember, knowledge is power. And in the age of the internet, understanding how to distinguish between fact and fiction is one of the most empowering skills we can possess. To truly understand the issue of misinformation and the importance of media literacy, we must first look to the past and trace the evolution of these challenges. In the early days of the internet, optimism was high. Here was a tool that promised to democratize information provide unprecedented access to knowledge, and connect people across vast differences. The internet was hailed as a revolution in information sharing and communication. It broke down barriers, allowed for the spread of ideas, and created a truly global community. But like all tools, the internet could be used for both good and ill. Even as it opened up the world, it also provided a platform for the spread of misinformation. I'm sure some of you remember their early days of email chain letters filled with urban myths, misleading information, <laughs> and outright falsehoods. This was our first widespread encounter with digital misinformation. Fast forward to today, and the issue has grown exponentially more complex. With the advent of social media, 
blogging platforms, and user-generated content, the internet has become a vast echo chamber, amplifying voices and ideas both truthful and deceptive. From the subtle distortions of facts to the spread of conspiracy theories and deep fake videos, misinformation has morphed and adapted with the times. And as our digital landscape becomes more sophisticated, so too does the misinformation it carries. The rise of sophisticated algorithms and artificial intelligence further complicates matters. These technologies have the power to shape and influence our digital experiences, sometimes guiding us towards more reliable information, but other times leading us down rabbit holes of misinformation. In light of this, the skill of media literacy has never been more important. It's no longer enough to simply access information we must also be able to critically analyze and verify it. This brings us to our first question to our panelists. Considering this historical context, what has been your experience navigating the vast sea of information on the internet? How have you personally encountered misinformation and what impact did it have on you? So I, you know, I remember when the internet first came out, <laughs> you know, I was maybe I was like seven or eight, but for those that know me, you wouldn't be surprised that the first website that I visited was StarTrek.com, <laughs> <laughs> and I was just blown away by <laughs> just being able to access, you know, like Star Trek information on you know on on a platform that I didn't knew before that existed. You know, I I, I used to use encarta you know the the computers back then would come with encarta 95 or whatever i got my first computer was uh an hp with the first pentium um and it brought in card 95 and i remember that i would just go and look just at all the articles that i could possibly get my hands on just like whatever thought i had i would just go on there and look it up and they had little videos and little cool things but now that same power that was in a cd you know cd drive was now available to us in our fingertips for just like going online and I remember how excited I used to get when, you know, you would hear the, the chiming of before you get on the internet. Um, and it was just, it was, a you know, this wave of excitement to know that I was about to access whatever I wanted um, in, and really ask whatever questions that I, that I needed to ask back then. Back then it was like AOL, the one that we use. Yeah. Um, and how strange that was to have the breadth of human knowledge, you know, easily accessible to us. But then we get into the problems that we started to get, and right after it was, it was it launched, we started to get a bunch of other false information and a bunch of other you know crazy websites that that popped up. So, yeah, I think you mentioned something important though um, when you talk about like access to information, but you also went on the internet looking specifically for Star Trek. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I kind of you know wonder when we get into like these rabbit holes or students kind of just go deep diving on the internet and then you kind of just like fall into this hole and uncover things. Um, is that where kind of the ill of the internet has power, you know, like empowering yourself, like you're going into the internet searching for something versus when you're going in using a tool, not knowing what you're looking for and then what you could find. Right. And what complicates it more, because, I mean, I joined the internet much older than you. <laughs> <laughs> so that was very sur surreal, go, you know, because I grew up in a time where it's like, I wonder what the answer to this question is. Moving on. You know? <laughs> there, was no, there was no way to immediately find the answer to that question, right? But, um, but then what the, what the other revolution that changed everything was social media and these, like, group chats and these ability, you know, these not only the ability to go and search, but then the ability to share and mm. to receive things. So, you know, yeah. to me, the epitome of that was during the the COVID pandemic and people sending all kinds of articles of how to prevent it. And, you know, mm -hmm. everyone becomes an expert all of a sudden. Yep. And, well, or not, or family members, you know, are, you know, suddenly the reach of a, a piece of information becomes much larger through these informal networks. Um, and, and you know, and that's why it's important to talk about yeah. understanding uh, how to assess credibility. Yeah. Yes, I definitely agree with you. I think there's a, a tendency with the internet being at our fingertips that all of a sudden you can go on Facebook and watch a couple of like doctor videos and you know everything as equal to someone who has a PhD. And it's like, no. <laughs> Yeah, you don't even know if this is factual. You don't have the proof going back. And 
before the internet and also going back to what you said of like if you had a question back in the day and you're like and if you really were like like you wanted to know what the answer was you had to go to the library you had to go through an encyclopedia right. and look through there and you're like oh okay but with the internet it's so easy and it's not just for adults that it's like easy access but for kids it's super easy i remember when the internet also came to be and i honestly think it was really interesting that to me the first like um social media platform was like facebook and like myspace but i remember facebook like all the kids were like lying about their ages because it was only like for <laughs> college students and so we would be like in middle school lying about our age so that way we would be cool and like that's something so in like the influence that the youth want to be like hip and want to be knowing what's going on what's the trendiest thing and kids at the end of the day are going to act like they're adults like they don't need any guidance when they're not aware of like the dangers that lie ahead and especially with online you could have someone say that they're your friend but really they're not there's some stranger who's trying to get you somewhere that you shouldn't be going right i, I think it's also important for us to recognize that lgbtq people really were among the very first people to access the internet to meet each other mm. to connect mm -hmm. because before 1994, 95, <laughs> I mean, we had to go out and we had to go to a club or to a bar. And there were many people all over the country, all over the world who didn't have access to the, what we have here in South Florida. So suddenly the world changed for so many people, particularly young people, particularly kids. Mm -hmm. I mean, you grow up in a household and you that with your parents, with your, your relatives, you know, I'm not like my brothers and sisters. I have different interests and I have different attractions. And, you know, back then, nobody spoke about it. Right. You just look like a weirdo, the black yeah. ape. Right? Sure. Yeah. But the internet gave you the ability to find out the information and to network with other people who are like, who are like you. you. Yes. Yeah. yeah, it really did open up a whole, you know, wealth of possibilities for people to connect and to you know, to, to see each other. And I think that from a historical perspective, you know, every single advancement that humanity has had in communications, you know, gives us what we want, what we need, what we're looking for, but also gives us what we don't want, what we're not really, you know, you know what's in the darkness that comes out to light as well, because we are very complicated beings and our collective, you know, minds create very complicated things. And I think that from a historical perspective, you know, the rise of the internet, it's no different than the rise of the printed, printed word. And even, even, you know, when you look at in the late 1800s and 1900s, you have the whole thing with yellow, yellow journalism, which really created, you know, this sensationalized way of bringing the news that were just so people can buy newspapers. But the consequences of that led to really serious things in this country, including, you know, leading to the, the Spanish American war. Because they just kept mis, you know, misinforming the public on what was happening. And, you know, I think that from we got over that. Like, I think journalism really stepped in and, you know, started to become a reputable institution to really call out these, you know, what, what's happening in the world. Sure. Yeah. Um, I can tell you that most mainstream journalists back in the 1990s didn't embrace the internet. They did not. In fact, they were threatened by it. They saw it as uh, somebody else, something else, a competitor of sorts, rather than being a part of it. And I remember back in the, well into the early 2000s, where reporters were not telling people about stories that were about to appear in the newspaper. Why? Because they didn't want the website to publish the story early to tip off the competition. And so therefore, you know, they would hold these stories and they didn't understand that the internet was their friend, that that was what was going to save the business, not harm the build, the business. Mm -hmm. The idea that anybody could, could write something and be distributed was very threatening. But going back to what you were saying about, um, you know, yellow journalism and the, the beginning of commercial, I guess, uh, for-profit journalism, Part of the issue, which is really the case today, too, is, 
you know, of media literacy is people understanding how the media business works and where the money comes from mm -hmm. and things like that, right? Because I think if people understand that newspapers are trying to make money and stuff, you know, then that puts things in perspective. So sure. the same thing holds now. What's the, you know, for people to understand what's the agenda, who's making the money, why are they doing that, right? But it's even worse today because when I joined the Miami Herald, it was still family owned. They had gone public, but the family still controlled the newspaper. First the, the Knights and then the Ritters. Families don't control the news industry anymore. You know, except for the New York Times, but even the Washington Post, Jeff Bezos owns that. Yeah. Uh, you know, look at the hedge funds that are you know, owning all of the other newspaper companies. And their interest is not journalism, it's just yeah. not. Their interest is either making a profit, which so far they've been un unsuccessful, or, and this is the thing that you know, we all question, why are these hedge funds buying newspapers buying co media companies to lose money why so what else is in it for them right i'm curious if you all have any thoughts on fox news and their perspective <laughs> 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 i feel like that's such a broad like like where do you want to go with this? <laughs> like, like, it's like what, where should we start where do we where do you want to start do we start with um is it tucker carlson who <laughs> was fired um, for his part in helping spread misinformation. Um, yeah, but I'm glad to see that with that, I feel like we're entering a world with renewed accountability. So like how you were mentioning before with journalism and like yellow journalism and then gaining rep reputability back, I feel like in history, there's always been a pendulum. There's always been like a yeah. rise and fall. Um, and I feel like during the pandemic, back to your point, we were all forced behind our screens so the only way we could interact with each other was through a screen. So now that we're out of the pandemic, like let's get back to learning from each other. Mm -hmm. Let's get back to having conversations from each other and not learning about things from an article on the internet that could have been written by AI or could be spread by somebody who has um, a hidden agenda right. back to the you know, topic of bunny. An yeah. important thing to consider about Fox News is that it's a product, right? And, yeah. it, and, yeah. and Fox, media is a larger thing that has other things that are not as, um, you know, terrible, right? <laughs> the, you know, there's Fox Sports, The Simpsons, The Simpsons mm -hmm. is a yeah. Fox product, right? Yeah. And Fox things. movies. Right. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Even right. though that's all owned by Disney now. Disney yeah, owned it was yeah. sold yeah. off. Right. Yeah. Exactly. It was all well, sold off. Yeah. That, that's yeah. the, yeah. why are they buying things? And it's because right. they're all invested. But, um, <laughs> but uh, you know, that they do that because it works, because it has a target consumer and it's giving them what they're asking for. Yeah. So that's important right. to remember. But they've also been very canny about how they've done it. And basically, they've separated their programming on Fox, on the news channel. Well, this is entertainment. This is news. The people who work all night long, they're not journalists. So let's not hold them to the same standards that we hold the person who's on at two o'clock in the afternoon who, you know, is reading news. Yeah. But, you know, you talk about Tucker Carlson or Sean Hannity, these are not journalists. And therefore they can say, they've got the right to say whatever they want. Right. And nobody has to fact check what they're mm. saying yeah. because they're not journalists. Because yes. their opinion and that, that exactly. I, I don't think back to media literacy that that's, that everybody's right. clear on how to distinguish. Right, does their audience understand like a person that is a media, whether whether it's Tucker Carlson, whether whoever it is, um, do does their does the general audience, does the general population in this country understand that that person is a media and not an expert journalist? I don't think they care. No, I really don't think don't. they care. And you know, I would have these conversations with other journalists. You'd open the Miami Herald and you'd look at a mix of ads and copy news stories and sports agate and mm -hmm. opinion mm -hmm. but then people would call and they say i want to talk to you about a story like on page six three six c rather it's like which story is it and they would so well it's that story and they would say no, i'm sorry that's not a story that's an ad <laughs> but they didn't see the difference yeah they didn't understand the difference they just saw this package yeah and but is, they, that, but is that i don't care or is that i on education Mm -hmm. Whatever it is, not they didn't. But they didn't see the difference, <laughs> right? Yeah, and I, th and I think that with Fox News, uh, there's there's an issue that Fox News is so on 
a, a, a different side, like a, a, he's so far ahead of something else that even there's there's no balance between the other two, the other big two, because even though they're not the same, what they're saying is somewhat in the realm of truth, like it's in the realm of truth, and Fox News is not. So you can even the people that are listening to that will just see the both the two other big players as speaking lies. I want to respond to that, but if <laughs> oh well. <laughs> Let, let's let's put a pause on this because I, I opened up a can of worms with that's <laughs> right. Yes. But so much of this from my from what I'm hearing is people want to hear what they want to hear. People mm -hmm. don't want their perspectives changed necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, it can be very threatening to hear a different perspective. True. So so much of news and media can be catering to one's own already personal beliefs and biases. But I think the beautiful thing about listening to other people's stories is that's when your world expands, right? Like if right. you are only in a little echo chamber where you're hearing the same thing day in and day out. How boring. How, <laughs> How boring. boring. Yeah. Like, I want to learn, like, right. And this might come from being raised in South Florida, being from a middle class family, being from a Hispanic family. Like, I grew up with the understanding where, like, I, I don't, I grew up thinking, like, I will, I'll never make it to Europe, right? I'll never get to see Michelangelo. I'll never get to see Da Vinci. Like, all of these things that you learn about in school that you're like, oh my God. I wish I could have seen that in person. And it wasn't until reading books that you get to experience that and you get to open up your entire world. So like, I just, I, but I also love reading. So that's just like for <laughs> young, anyone young who's like, yeah. pick up a book, like you w will travel and you just open up your world. Yeah, absolutely. Knowledge is power. And that was a fascinating journey through history, shedding light on how we've arrived here. But how does this play out in the real world today? Let focus from the pages of history to the stories of real world examples of how these issues can infiltrate our everyday lives. Stay tuned. Schools and Happening Out Television Network, Commitment to Safe Schools TV. One of our most popular programs is Tiffany Explains It All. It broadcasts every other Friday at 10 a.m. and then on demand on social media platforms and soon will also be seen on Roku and Apple TV. Welcome to Tiffany Explains It All, the ultimate destination for all things pop culture. I'm your host, Tiffany. I'm here to spill the tea, serve some sass, and keep you on the loop on the latest LGBTQ plus entertainment, anime, movies, and so much more. Every week, we'll dive into the stories that matter to you, exploring the hidden gems of the world of entertainment and celebrating the incredible diversity and creativity of our community, from the hottest new anime releases to the fiercest queer icons and movies that make it go, yas queen, we've got you covered. So buckle up my fabulous friends as we embark on a glittery journey to discover, discuss, and dissect the most intriguing and captivating aspects of queer pop culture. This is Tiffany Explains It All, your one-stop shop to get the 411 on everything fabulous and fierce. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you never miss an episode. Let's get started. So luckily we have today Tiffany from Tiffany Explains It All on our panel. Hi. <laughs> Tiffany, you want to give the viewers a better idea of Tiffany Explains It All? Um, oh, where do I even start? Well, we definitely talk about media and we definitely talk about entertainment and we talk about what's happening currently and also the correlations and some of the lgbt like undertones that are in all of those topics i think a lot of people are usually surprised when they hear about a movie that has some queer representation that they didn't realize or an anime or a tv show that they're like i can resonate with that person and that character and they like the same things i do and we have maybe the same style choices and then also talking about the serious topics you know like book bannings uh voting rights all those things just to amplify just how important those things are and making sure that everyone is on the same page when we're talking about that because those topics don't just disappear because we don't want to talk about them or they're not interesting enough because they're not as dazzling as entertainment mm -hmm. but they're just as important if not more important can i just say i'm like obsessed and <laughs> I, wanna, like, I just want to give you your flowers really quick because i think what you're doing is so important because i was watching that and i was literally thinking to myself like i learned like i like my introduction into like our community and learning about the issues that were important to us 
was when I was 11 years old, secretly watching RuPaul's Drag Race on <laughs> like, and I don't think that was maybe an appropriate way for an 11 year old to learn about issues in our community. And I think that what you're doing, like, I wish I had, you know, your show when I was growing up. Like, it's so amazing. That's actually a really important thing. A lot of people who are like older generation, like millennials and even beyond that they tell me they're like honestly it gives off like an after school programming and I kind of wish I had that growing yeah. up of like that exposure and I'm like I'm glad that this is healing your inner child yeah. just as much as it's healing all the youngins yeah. that are watching it and it's and it's intentional you know part of the whole um main thing with the show was that we wanted to cover mm -hmm. um the things that we, I mean, as, me as a millennial, I grew up with Sailor Moon, with Captain Planet, with like Beast Wars. Oh, PBS. Oh, PBS, all these other <laughs> things that were, that, you know, they weren't predominantly queer, but they had such queer elements mm. that I resonated Reading Rainbow. With. Reading like, Rainbow, yeah. yeah. Reading, reading with the lions. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, if the funny thing is like the Magic School Bus has yeah. all these kids. I think Captain Planet has like the same kids, but they, they've grown up and they're working together and like they're trying to save the planet. I mean, it was really ingrained in us that we need to be caretakers of our planet, that we need to be work together. We need to have empathetic. a collective empathetic to one another. And that, you know, even though that's not particularly queer, that is part of the queer expression. There's no, there's no Just our queer values. Movement. Yes, our values. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I yeah. don't think you can be a positive member in our community without having empathy. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So we have to move on to our next segment. But thank you, Tiffany. And be <laughs> sure to check out Tiffany Explains It All. Thank you. In today's world, we're constantly plugged in, aren't we? Our phones ping with social media notifications. Our inboxes fill up with newsletters and news updates flash across our screens. Now in this sea of information lies a pressing concern, misinformation. This is not a new phenomenon, but with the advent of the internet and social media, the speed and reach of misinformation have drastically increased. Now let's imagine a real life scenario. Picture a student named Alex. Like many teenagers, Alex uses social media to connect with friends, follow interest, and stay updated on current events. One day, Alex comes across a blog post shared by a friend. The post makes some shocking claims about climate change, suggesting that it's a hoax created by certain political groups to control the economy. Alex is concerned. Climate change is a topic they're passionate about, and they've seen the effects in their own community. Rising temperatures, extreme weather events, and changes in local wildlife. This post challenges everything they've learned in school and seen firsthand. But as we know, not all that's posted online is true. Unfortunately, the post that Alex read was indeed misinformation, expertly disguised as a well-researched article. This single blog post has the potential to reshape Alex's understanding of climate change to the point of influencing their actions, such as recycling less or disregarding Earth Day activities. And if Alex shares this post, the misinformation continues to spread, potentially influencing more people. As we can see from Alex's experience, misinformation has the power to distort our understanding of the world. It can fuel harmful stereotypes, sow doubt about scientific facts, and even stir up conflict. Now, I'd like to ask our panel of experts, have you ever encountered a situation like Alex's? How did you react? What did you do to confirm the validity of the information you received? I think there's something key in what you mentioned earlier in terms of like confirming the validity of what we're hearing. You mentioned Alex can see with his own eyes climate change happening around him. And I think that's important and powerful because I think sometimes as young people, we're kind of bullied into believing that we're, we're not experts or we don't like we don't have validity in what we're saying or um, what adults say to us is the truth and what we believe isn't necessarily the truth. Um, and to that, I would say, like, don't let adults bully you into believing certain mm -hmm. things and like believe your own eyes, trust your own eyes, trust your instinct, think mm -hmm. critically about the world around you and look at everything. And it's also OK to say, I'm not sure, I'm still researching that before forming an opinion on anything. Yeah. Just yeah. because you read something on the internet does not mean you need to have an opinion on it. Truly, <laughs> truly. 
But sometimes even like if you don't know something and again, sometimes it's like the concept of seeing is believing. So you can search up something online, but maybe you know you can meet someone who's like on the ground that's yes. actually experiencing that and actually like interact with them and be like, hey, is this actually happening? And how long has this been happening? And what can I do to amplify their voices mm -hmm. and also show support, whatever that may be? Because sometimes you have to ask them what are the best like options to help them mm -hmm. versus making that assumption of Absolutely. like, oh, maybe I should do this. It's like, no, like yes. if you can ask and if they tell you, you need to do this yeah. and X, Y, Z, and that helps you then understand what it is that they're asking for. Mm -hmm. And when there's a moment where like they need voices to be amplified and when you need to be quiet and just be there for yeah. moral support as well. It reminds me of something that we, we try to teach our students. So we have something called the spectrum of uh, the continuum spectrum, spectrum of service. And so what you're saying is exactly right, right? Like how many times have you seen like these volunteer or these mission trips that are like, we're going to go in and do this to this community because we think that you need that. Right. Yeah. Instead of actually going into a community, listening mm -hmm. and listening hard, talking to everyone, mm -hmm. immersing yourself in that culture, mm -hmm. and then asking, how can, what, what can I do to help you? And like, how can I help you? Not, mm -hmm. I'm here to do this. Right. Yeah. Go ahead. I was just going to say that, you know, everything that we've been talking about is great, but we live in a time, in an era where we're being told also, don't believe what you're seeing. Mm -hmm. That, you true. know, we now, I mean, we can go back to, two days after Donald Trump became president and Kellyanne Conway began talking about their alternative facts. And you can believe what you want, but we have our own set of facts. And there's you know, millions of people today who would choose, choose to believe the facts that they feel more comfortable with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, January 6th is a great example of people looking at something and seeing something and then not agreeing upon what we saw. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think one of the, the challenge, I mean, if it was only a matter of verifying facts as if as like something happened or something didn't happen, I mean, that's already enough of a challenge. But then it's the interpretation of it too, mm -hmm. right? The intent, who's behind it, why was it done? And then that is a matter of worldviews and beliefs, right? Right. So then some of, so, you know, some people are, are legitimately i did some work on like vaccine hesitancy during COVID and things like that some people legitimately without the mm -hmm. any ill intent right we're very afraid for you for getting vaccinated mm -hmm. yeah right of course right and so th that's misinformation from a perspective but it wasn't done with the intent to to deceive right and uh, and that's where it gets really tricky right that we right. have become so entrenched in world views that um, you know, the op a different interpretation than ours can be perceived right. as an intent to deceive, and it's so it's so complicated. Yeah, and and I and I do agree with I agree with with everyone in the same way. <laughs> and and yes, yeah. Steve, there is we you know we are entrenched. We are there are people out there that want to believe their version of the universe, their version of what's happening, and they have all you know um, become they they've they've clumped together into this mass of, mm -hmm. of falsity. Um, but recently I had this experience with a family member that I don't know if any one of you have heard of this movie, The Sound of Freedom. It's, it's yes. it has become this like weird thing that everyone is commenting yeah. about. Even Vanity Fair wrote an article about it. And I'm like, what is Vanity Fair doing writing an article about this movie from the perspective of the people that are like, Oh, Disney, you know, tried to shelve this movie because it talks about child um, trafficking. Um, trafficking and they're on you know, they're on board with that. And, you know, the elite are all child trafficking people. And this is the crazy thing. And I'm talking to this family member and they as they talk about the movie, they unravel and they're like crying. And I mean, it's like I for, they go from from smiling to unraveling in like, mm. a, I mean, I was just in shock. I was just watching like what is happening right now. Yeah. And then, you know. I have I have been have have had uh, 
and actually touch people that have worked with child trafficking in, in Miami Dade. Mm. You know, Mujer and down in Homestead that in South Dade, that is a that's that's something that is actively happening right now as we speak at this table. Right. So I told them, my this family member like if you would like to actually see what is happening, get involved with what and is help. happening, yeah. and help, I can take you to them. Oh, but no, but that's you. too uncomfortable. Oh, right? no, no, no. Right, I, I, would, right. I would rather just pray for them. Okay. Right. I'm just going to pray for them. And but, I'm like, but this is this is a joke. Like, so it's drama. Um, so it's it's drama, drama yeah. for you. But yeah. to say, like, it's someone's go, actual yeah, life. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. But to say, like, go there and do the work. See what's happening so you don't get misinformed and you see that it's not... You know the, the the Clintons and this who what who, who have whatever else they believe mm -hmm. the child trafficking mm -hmm. in a pizza in a pizzeria. Yeah. that's not what's happening. It's giving yeah. high school. It's giving high school drama. Yeah, yeah. but like confirming <laughs> what you already believe about the world, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. And I, I think what you're telling us is so interesting because suddenly we can't say these are other people that we don't know people like that because suddenly. When we start to talk about our own family members and people who, in our extended mm -hmm. friends and family network, mm -hmm. that we do know people like that. Absolutely. Yeah. And they don't agree with everything that we think. And we try to explain things to them and they, their minds are not open. Perhaps from their perspective that our minds are not as open either. And so suddenly there are topics you stay away from. Mm. Yes. You get together on Thanksgiving and we're not going to talk about Donald Trump and we're not going to talk about politics mm. because it's too hot button and we don't want to ruin the day. But you should. But, and that's the silence is. Yeah. I think that's also depending on like the person like there are just going back on what you said about some people's perspective of actually learning the true history of something, the real truth and the thing about truth and history is that it's not pretty it's, it's not hard it's hard yeah. and i understand as a woman who is latina but i'm also a, i'm a white woman so when i hear some of those things i'm like i would never ever do any of those horrible things but i can understand where someone who doesn't look like me that is from that same demographic group feel uncomfortable around me right and it's like it's not up to not me, personal. it's not it's not, it's not a personal battle. And I think that's something that people who are closed minded for us don't seem to understand. And they it's almost like it's it's so hard to kind of like talk about because like you see that they kind of understand what you're saying. Like there's something that is clicking, but it's also they're hesitating because in cl clicking with that information, that means they have to acknowledge Challenge their own beliefs. Yes, it rem it's it's kind of like um, the cave analogy, and I don't know if I don't know is that Plato? I don't know who that yeah, is, yeah, but yeah. <laughs> um, right, like the truth hurts and yeah. it'll blind you and it'll hurt your eyes, right? And then you're gonna want to run back into the cave and like grab everyone out with you to see the truth, but it might hurt them, and and they would prefer to stay in the <laughs> cave. And yeah, I think that's gonna be. It's it's been a, that's been a problem since Plato. I think it's going to be you know the challenge of humanity always. Yep. And in Florida right now, what we're seeing, yep. and for educators, mm -hmm. I would be you know panicked at the idea that you yourselves may be mandated yes. to Re offer misinformation yes. to young people in your classes. And then you see the 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 mass exodus of teachers because. We can't morally do it. Exactly. Yeah. I we I won't do it. And I, I think, you know, I'm so thankful that I, I get to work at a private university mm -hmm. and there are some protections in place. But I, you know, I have friends that are in the public school system in Miami-Dade County. And yeah. and again, but also but this also ties back to like how powerful your local state and federal government are mm -hmm. and how like getting involved with your community the power of your local community to protect you because right now miami-dade county is trying to, obviously like we live in a very blue county um yeah. so they're fighting back they don't right they don't agree with the rest of the state and so the county is trying it's doing its best um sure. and so i would say right now the, the teachers that i do know they're looking a little safe for now but i mean who knows how long that's going. yeah I, I am curious about your all's perspective um regarding hot button topics about the queer and trans experience and alternative facts and mm -hmm. what you've all heard and been exposed to. I think the trans experience is a perfect example of how when you have misinformation or people 
purposefully going and destroying information, how you lose knowledge, right? Yeah. So trans mm -hmm. people have always been around. There was the Trans Institute um, in Europe. I don't know exactly what country <laughs> it was, right? But there was the historic book burning where they yes. raided that institution. They took every piece of literature, every piece of writing, every piece of research, right? And that wasn't on the internet, right? Because this was yeah. back in like 1930, 1940. So there was no internet to digitally catalog that and mm -hmm. preserve that. It was all books. So they burned it all and now we're trying to people are trying to come to you in this in this in, in today now we're in 2023 and people are like trans people have never existed and it's like no, no. you burned their history <laughs> exactly you try to erase them yeah but they've always been around mm -hmm. exactly and i think it's not it's quite interesting because now people are learning that now because there are some people who do believe like, oh, this is just a new thing that's just happening. No. It's like a phase. It's like, no, this has actually been around for the beginning of time. Like you have even archaeologists in sites that are finding out that information. They're like, they can yes, see. Yes, the skeleton was, was yeah, the <laughs> skeleton is biologically male, no, but it was, it was buried, buried with the rights of a woman. Absolutely. Yes. So you have you have evidence of past cultures mm -hmm. respecting and empathizing the the chosen identity of, of people. Yeah. Exactly. And so if a caveman can do it, I feel <laughs> like, like we can, can, we can do it. Why can we? can. Okay. Come on, y'all. Yeah, yeah, let's get with it. <laughs> but uh, you, a lot of it is dependent upon education. And when I say education, I don't just mean teaching children in a classroom. No. But you have older people who also need education. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the problems I've seen as an observer is knowing that there are plenty of older gay men mm -hmm. who still don't understand why a trans issue is their issue. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that, you know, you look at the information being given to these people, uh, that there, I think that there's been a failing in explaining pe to people why this is important. Mm -hmm. but, but I also think that there is a failure also on our side by not giving them the safe space to express those feelings. Mm -hmm. I think that mm -hmm. a lot of times we tend to shame people Ooh, and, yeah. and, and we don't allow them to be in that safe space to be like, you know what? I just I'm don't understand this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. yeah. And, and you know, I, I've heard this many times from a lot of well, I mean, even even I was at a school board meeting recently in um uh, at Broward, and this woman who said, you know, who's, who's a lesbian, she has a daughter there. She was against Queer History Month. And the reason she was against it is because she, just, she said, I don't want this to become my identity. I don't want it to be my identity. And the thing, and, and, and she wrote it, and I felt bad for her because she wrote her little speech expecting to get booed by the other side mm. and she and no one booed her but she was like and you might be hearing them boo me and this is the thing with the queer community they're always so judgmental they don't allow any other you know the difference and of everyone's opinion. quiet yeah and everyone's quiet and everyone like you know i get it i understand i i get well because fear. i kind of get her like, sentiment too because it's like oh so is only white cis male history american history and then everything else is black history queer history right. feminist theory right. like why isn't my history as american as everybody uh, else yeah. is yeah. i don't know and, and and that's why i think it's important for us to create safe spaces for yeah. people to ask these questions yeah. and not shame them because I, I honestly don't think that m most people are just like so anti-trans that they're gonna like right you know be like oh we can't do that i just right, think people yeah. are misinformed yeah. they hear one story that gets put out of, out of, out of you know out of proportion yeah. and they just and now they're afraid to ask questions so they become their own internal silos mm -hmm. i mean we used to hear this word intersectionality yeah i don't hear it very much but frankly intersectionality what that says to me is that you can be gay you can mm -hmm. be hispanic you could be black, you could be male, you could be, you know, non-binary, and you can be all of these things at the at same, same time. time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and the more of those that you are, the harder, you yeah, know, harder life is, yeah. is for you. And I think part of it is the people that have lived comfortably in the world because the world was made for them, right? The, yeah. um, you know, even maybe with, you know, they're not even aware of these groups and that people in these groups are struggling, right? I yeah. mean, I've had conversations. Yeah. I'm pretty proud of of my dad and his open <laughs> mind. But, you know, I've had conversations with, with him. He's like, oh, my God, gosh, nowadays it's harder to be 
black than to be a woman he's saying that and i'm like imagine a black woman he's like <gasps> <"There's> <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> never even <laughs> thought of the horror like, right of that. <laughs> and uh and you know and i was uh, telling him about a, a trans uh gender person that i that was my friend he's like Wow, imagine how many people in my day felt that way. Wow. Mm -hmm. Couldn't do anything, yeah. right? So it's just like yeah. no clue because they had never come in front of their face. And, right? I would, yeah. and I would just like to say really quickly, like our job as educators is not to tell people, you need to believe this, you need to do this. I feel like our job as educators is we're just here to show empathy and mm -hmm. show what respect and living in a world where everyone gets respect and empathy could look like. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. I think that's an excellent mic drop <laughs> moment. <laughs> yeah. We have to move forward. So these powerful stories remind us why we're here and why these conversations are so important. But it's not just about identifying the problem. It's about finding solutions. What are the tools at our disposal? What strategies can we employ? Let's find out in our tools and resources segment. As we navigate the digital landscape, we often find ourselves in uncharted territories where facts and fiction are so intricately woven together that it's challenging to tell them apart. But fear not, for we have our tools at our disposal to help us discern truth from untruth and resources that can guide us on our way. One such tool is fact-checking websites. Websites like Snopes, PolitiFact and factcheck.org are dedicated to uncovering and exposing false information. Whether they be in the form of news stories, social media posts, or viral content, these sites employ professional fact checkers who investigate claims and rate their accuracy. Before you share that viral post or believe that shocking news story, it's always a good idea to cross-reference with these websites. Another important tool is reverse image searching. Let's say you come across a striking image attached to a news story, but something about it raises your suspicions. By using a reverse image search tool, like the one provided by Google, you can track the origins of the image, find out where else it has been used, and see if it truly aligns with the context you found it in. This can be particularly useful in uncovering misleading or manipulated images. And most importantly, cultivating critical thinking skills is key to identifying misinformation. This includes checking the credibility of the source, considering multiple viewpoints, analyzing the evidence, and always questioning before accepting information at face value. There are also educational resources available, such as News Literacy Projects Checkology, a virtual classroom designed to help students understand the difference between credible and non-credible content and Media Literacy Now, providing resources and advocacy for media literacy education. But we must remember tools and resources are only as effective as the person wielding them. That's why education, both self-directed and within our schools, is so crucial. And now I turn it over to our panelists. In your experience, how effective are these tools in countering misinformation? Have you come across other resources or strategies that have helped you to identify misinformation online? Going back to something that we had talked about earlier in the conversation, and that was being able to go to the New York Times or the Washington Post mm -hmm. or the Miami Herald to get information to, to see, has anyone else written this story? And what was their take on it? Mm -hmm. We now run into a problem that in terms of the business of journalism, and that's what we talked about before. But what we didn't mention was the paywall mm -hmm. and yeah. how it's yeah. no longer freely accessible to people to get that information. Yep. Mm -hmm. You need to subscribe, you know, or somebody needs to gift you a story. So if you're trying to figure out, is that correct? And you say, well, let me check with the New York Times or you Google it. Easy, right? Mm -hmm. And oh, the New York Times wrote about that but you can't access the story mm -hmm. to get the information. Yeah. Yeah. There's something inherently unfair when we're talking about perhaps students right. who they don't have the money to subscribe to the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal perhaps or any other, and their local paper. Which is why the public libraries are so important. <laughs> yeah, I was literally I'm, the same thing. I'm a huge supporter like, of the public libraries. I think everyone needs a library card. And now with things like Libby that you can down, like you have access to check out books, a 
Anyway, but small plug for the library. But yes. <laughs> Speaking of libraries, this is a dirty little secret that the newspapers don't want you to know uh -huh. because they sell their archives, and most of the archives are available for free at, at the public library. Mm -hmm. And you can access it from home. Mm -hmm. yes, you don't have to go to the library to access the library, library. anymore. <laughs> yeah. Most people don't even realize that. Yeah. yeah. So go going back to fact checking, um, for sure, I mean, hoaxes are not generally believed by everybody, right? There's, <laughs> there's people who, who fact check and, and, and so looking at other sources, right? And, and even subscribing to sources that have different points of view so that you can see how mm -hmm. different stories are covered yeah. and mm -hmm. kind of forcing yourself to look at different perspectives because kind of a, the point, you know, what I said earlier that fact and that something actually happened is one thing, but then how it's interpreted, right? Yeah. So the folks mm -hmm. that can go to the New York Times article, go to the article from some other web Mm -hmm. magazine talking about the the New York Times article and then someone criticizing the right. New York Times article and and so it's it's like a game of telephone right it is. It's, it's people yeah. writing about the 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 original story and I think your point also speaks to like the power of primary sources right mm -hmm. so like no shade to journalism but why read an article about like the Holocaust for example when you can read the diary of Anne Frank and like read from the person who lived it and was in it and i think that's the best way you can build empathy as well sure. yeah go to museums and, and, yeah museums. absolutely yes. and, and like even for me sorry it's one second like i i there have been times that i have seen a story online and i'm like oh this cannot be real and then i go onto like snopes.com and i see that oh well it's Maybe it's half real. They're gonna tell you there's a, you know, it's not, it's not this, but it is this. You know, there's just a, there's a high probability that there are there's some truth to this, and I, la I you know, I laugh at myself not because I would get upset because I wanted so hard to believe that it wasn't true. <laughs> right. And then Snopes itself was telling me that well, there's some truth to this, and I'm like, oh. By Politifact, but, the same way that you'll see the dial will shift, yeah. and maybe yeah. the dial's like in the middle, and it's partially true. Right. But which yeah. part yeah. exactly? Yeah, well, I mean, on top of that, I think TikTok, I know that's like a, a <laughs> new thing, but going back to what you were saying is that sometimes people don't have like the, the mental bandwidth to sit there and read through an article. They maybe right. skim through it because I know I've done it. I'm sure we've all done that where we're like, I don't have time to sit here and just read through this whole article. And with TikTok, it's such in a small little like right. blip but you get so much information in that small little blip. And you even have people that like, I've seen countless videos of like older generations who lived and survived through the Holocaust of people being at um, native like protests and talking about all the current events. And even journalism on, on TikTok the, is like fast. It on is, the ground. It's, on the ground. Yeah, yeah. Like you're literally posting, like you could post a live and you're watching it unfold as it's happening yeah. and like yes is there chances that there's a lot of misinformation once you post that yes because almost everything that we post nowadays can be easily taken out of context and just <laughs> and like twisted around but i think there is so much more potential yeah us. potential yeah. for it to be like I feel like a lot of people, especially young people nowadays, I hear more people talk about like using TikTok. They're like, that's where the real journalism, because, you know, people aren't afraid to talk about, you know, what's really going on and no one's getting paid for it because yeah. with, like yeah. news stations. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. some are. But with even news stations, like you mentioned earlier, a lot of these like papers are now being bought by these CEOs and these companies. Mm -hmm. Like, what is the alternative? alternative motive for them having these because sometimes when you look at the news that they're taking like they're putting out yeah. they're like that that doesn't fact up that doesn't match up with what's going on currently and it's like now you're morphing the news to fit whoever's putting money in your pocket right well i mean but i'm also have great concerns about tiktok i mean oh yeah there yeah. are not yeah. many issues that you'll suddenly you'll see republicans and democrats all together in you know such as TikTok, where they're, they're suddenly yeah. expressing this fear and disdain and we need mm -hmm. to control this this platform because we don't trust it but that's been but the, we don't trust the ownership or we don't well, we don't trust the ownership right well, well there's the thing there's about the, thing. the ownership yeah <laughs> but then also because 
to for, to older people like us, right? The first impression we had of TikTok was like that it was for dancing and for like middle middle school type yeah. of fun sure. for the fun, yeah, right? Right. For... That, but now there's a lot of serious quality content on there, right? So that's again where the discerning right. how you know the, and, and understanding the source, the motivation of the source, the funding of the yes. source. Sure. Yes, like do they want to control TikTok because there is a true you know thread, or is it that? people see the power of something that started for fun yeah. is now causing allowing young people empowering young people to become advocates to become activists it allows people mm -hmm. to connect and you know is it is it truly a threat or is it you know the the power of in the young people's hands but, i mean but, look a program like this a network like this what's so interesting about this network is it's a 501c3 Right. Mm -hmm. right. And as a result, you know, it's subsidized by grants and fundraising, etc. Yeah. But it's all freely available, maybe yeah. not today to find out who contributed yeah. yesterday. Yeah. But as it sticks around and continues to grow year after year, like any other nonprofit, there's accountability. Yes. And you can easily look up to see who's giving money to this organization and where is the money going? Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm also curious if you've all come across any misinformation about LGBTQ um, issues and, and what did you do about it? How did you handle that when you came across it? Or what do you okay. suggest for people when they do? I think I, beyond just the voting, going out and vote, <laughs> yeah. right? We all talk about like the power of your vote. Um, but if you can't vote, what do you do, right? You can, mm -hmm. you can drive people, you can rally people. I think something that has been so powerful. I know personally, like speaking very personally, um, when you had the overturn of like all of these things happening, it was a scary time for LGBTQ and we didn't know if like marriage equality was next, right? To be taken away. Mm -hmm. Just talking openly with your friends and family yeah. who care about you, like, yeah. and genuinely and honestly expressing like your concerns. And, you know, I, I think there's, you, I don't undervalue, there's an inner humanity in all of us. Yeah. And especially when it's your friends and family and they see how intensely it, it impacts you, they will rally behind you and want to yeah. vote with you. So like, you know, even if you can't vote, you can build community, make friends and empower others to do it for you, yeah. with yeah. you. That's exactly right. I think that when you hear someone talking about mis saying something that is just not true yeah. instead again instead of shaming them and and putting down the the you know the gauntlet of truth on them right. become right. their friend and conversation be like, hey, what what's happening yeah. you know like let's why don't we talk about this over have coffee, a human over connection tea. yeah show them that what right so like i right homophobia right being f a fear of gay people yeah. Be the positive, friendly gay person to show them that it's we're not scary. what they think, you yeah. know? And I think that's so important. I think growing up, one of the reasons that maybe it took me so long to come out is I didn't have any positive representations of lesbians in media, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I had RuPaul's Drag Race and the L word. And it's <laughs> yeah. like, maybe, so be, be, I, I think the answer is also be what you want our community to be right. and represent us well. Yeah, I mean, uh, people... It's try to say, you know, be out, be yourself, yes. but be out because if you can, and and when I, I would yeah, when I would interview yeah. mm -hmm. kids, and you know, many of you, uh, you know, work with children, yeah. and I remember speaking to kids at whether Pride Lines Youth or whatever, and reminding kids that what I was writing was for the Miami Herald. And that it's great if they felt comfortable to talk with me or to have their pictures taken, but to remind them several times that they're going to be seen in a newspaper, their families may see them, their friends may see them, and to think it through. And there's nothing wrong if you don't want to be in that picture. Yeah. Stand over there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and that's okay. And it's okay because we've seen a lot of pressure through the years you know, the whole coming out project. Yeah. I mean, which, you know, sounds great and it was great, right. but the pressure put on people who were not ready to come out. Mm -hmm. And I would tell kids, if you're not able to support yourself, if you have to depend upon your parents to, you know, put you through college, to provide food for you or a roof over your head 
and you don't feel that you can trust that they will continue to do that if you come out, don't come out until you can take care of yourself. Yeah. 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 And there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Yeah. I think in terms of, of misinformation and harm that can be done now in the media is a lot with uh, gender affirming care for, mm. for children. Mm -hmm. mm. It's just such a, a great topic to jump on with misinformation, right? Yeah. Oh, about. And extremely, especially with like currently what's going on in the States and just in our own backyard. I mean, I've gone to enough meetings that have been talked about that. And I've even heard people like say some outlandish things. And I'm like, where is your common sense? No offense, but mm -hmm. where do you think that these children, yes, is there some children that they identify, they know who they are at a young age and they, they come out to their parents and they're like, I'm, I'm trans, I'm not a boy, I'm a girl, or I'm a girl, I'm a boy. And, you know, they have that conversation with their pediatrics and they just talk to doctors. But the kids, at the end of the day, they're not calling the shots. You have professionals in the field that are like, okay, well, these are the options we have for right now. And, you know, later down the line, we can go into further detail for other things. And it's just, they're making it sound like it's a slaughterhouse situation mm -hmm. and it's not. Yeah. <laughs> just also, I think, like, the danger of politicizing people's private lives. Like, yes. I really, like... Children. I kind of want to like yeah. take like I kind of like I really want I wish I could go up to those people and just be like take a step back for a second like let's not talk about politics right now like let's talk about like an actual family y your your opinion that you hold is genuinely hurting somebody yeah yeah and could genuinely result in someone being seriously harmed mm -hmm. can we just talk like like the realistic like, yeah. like, let's talk about that. Like, yeah. I want, like, your humanity, like, let's connect there and then, like, what, yeah. I don't know, yeah. Or, or, like, what is your obsession with the 1% of the 10%? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. come on. It's, you don't, you probably don't even know somebody, you know, like, relax. Exactly. But I think that brings up a very important point that you all were mentioning around humanizing the human situation here. It's yeah. very easy yeah. to judge something, to hate something when it's mm -hmm. in the political. abstract, mm -hmm. when it's political. Mm -hmm. But really, if you're not familiar with something, if you're unsure about something, try to find someone, get to know someone. Yep. And it can really be a transformative experience. Mm -hmm. And it can really happen in experiences where there's a coming out experience in the, mm -hmm. within a family that parents who may have been hesitant or afraid or judgmental right. when they realize it's their child it completely can morph their experience Absolutely. sure not always yeah. but certainly but really yeah. get a chance to know people before you start forming opinions Absolutely. Yeah. but we have to move on so we've discussed <laughs> uh, we've equipped ourselves with knowledge and tools but what lies ahead how do we prepare for the future what challenges and opportunities await us Let's explore the future of misinformation that in many ways is already unfolding as we speak. This broadcast is part of Safe Schools and Happening Out Television Network, Commitment to Safe Schools TV. One of our most popular programs is The Tea with Eddie. It broadcasts every other Friday at 10 a.m. and then on demand on social media platforms and soon will also be seen on Roku and Apple TV. Hey Fabulous friends, welcome back to another episode of The Tea with Eddie, where we share thoughts and spill the tea on politics, pop culture, and everything in between, all from an unapologetically queer perspective. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell to stay in the loop. Today, we are embarking on an exploration of an existential threat to our democracy and free society, misinformation and fake news. So let's get started. So we don't have Eddie here today, but we do have the producer of The Tea with Eddie, Harold. And I was hoping Harold could share some perspective about the thought process behind The Tea with Eddie, its mission, and what, what viewers can expect. Yeah, so what, when we were doing all this digital um, rebranding of Safe Schools, one of the things that I wanted to do was touch people on different levels. And The Tea with Eddie and Tiffany explains it all. They're two very different shows, but they're covering kind of the same thing. Tiffany over here, she is talking to an audience from a much like a fun perspective talking about like what has inspired them what has come through pop, culture. uh, pop cultural yes. things 
while Eddie, on the other hand, is a little bit more serious. You know, Eddie talks mm-hmm. about the history. Eddie talks about what we can do, how we better understand things. So they're both reaching some of the same audience, but they're coming from two different perspectives. Yeah, I feel like Eddie is like m- like my high school, middle school, like news broadcast in the morning. Yeah. Yes. Like I want to get my bowl of cereal and sit down and like watch Eddie and like catch up on the news while mm-hmm. my parents watch like Channel 7, which is yeah. okay. <laughs> and then like I'm going to get home from school and watch Tiffany mm-hmm. and catch up on like all the pop culture stuff that I was talking about with my friends. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I think what you were saying is that I think for someone who probably isn't like aware of this information and they want to know more, my segment, it's a more of a softer feel. You can't, it's subtle. It's subtle. It's kind of like, oh, she's dressed in really colorful stuff. I really like her makeup. And she's talking about something that I find really interesting. Yeah. With Eddie, it's like, okay, now that you kind of understand the idea, the topic that we're talking about, do you want a more in-depth conversation? You go to tea with Eddie. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and the shows do feed up each other. Yeah. If, if I don't know if, if someone who's seen the shows, the, um, you know, Tiffany talks about say, the impact of Sailor Moon on the queer community. And then Eddie talks <laughs> about the impact of anime on film uh, and not just in the queer community, but on, on, on a lot of the major products that we have produced here in, in, yeah. in the U.S. when it comes to our creativity. Yeah. And, and I had someone recently tell me that she's so happy with the tea with Eddie because she can finally show something to her grandma and be like, grandma, this is what I do. This mm. is, this is, ex- here is what I do yeah. in the school yeah. system. You know, explain to kids like this, like Eddie's doing, how to better understand their, you know, what's happening in the world and what's happening with them and how it impacts them. So when mm-hmm. she's told me that, I was like, oh, that's nice. You know, I'm glad that, you know, your grandma can understand now, like what you do. G- yeah. Gave it that power. Yeah. I said it before. I'll say it again. Like, I'm so thankful. <laughs> like, y'all exist. Like, I wish, I'm so jealous. I wish I had this when I was younger. Really. I, mean, I, I just find it so interesting and, and, and amazing that when I started covering LGBT back in the 1990s, I couldn't even get people to go on the record. And the first decision that we made when I began covering this beat was that everyone had to be on the record and give their names or else I wasn't going to write about them. I wanted what I was doing. I wanted it to be about real people, people who were known in the community or known in their neighborhoods. And so I would have to sometimes go to, through an entire interview and then somebody might change their mind. So, you know, I really, I really can't be in, in the Herald. Yeah. I say, well, I understand that, but unfortunately I can't use the interview. And then in the beginning, I mean, I, I would have to sometimes interview several people and then just to be able to find the person who would be in in the end willing to go on the record. Yeah. I would go in, I would take pictures. I would do a lot of social things for, for the Herald. I would start a blog and I'd go in with the camera, go to the clubs, take pictures and put them on Facebook or wherever. And I remember being invited by, I guess, Alison Burgos and some of the other women to come to one of the women's nights. There weren't that many. <laughs> there never <but> are. <laughs> <laughs> there weren't. And I would go in with my camera and I, Unlike the men's events, all of a sudden, the women, I'd, they'd start going like this, mm-hmm. and they would turn their heads. And Allison realized what was happening. She apologized to me. I said, no, you don't have to apologize, because I understand what's going on. These women, they're worried about losing their children, many of them. Mm-hmm. It's as simple as that. Yeah. We lived yeah. in a time when, you know, it wasn't legal for gay people to adopt. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I understood they had angry ex-husbands and all they needed to do was to say, look, here's a picture of her in the Miami Herald, take it to court. Yeah. Yeah. It was as simple as that. But, but people got past that as the, as the times changed, as the laws changed, yeah. you know, people began to feel, and as younger people began to come up where they weren't necessarily ever in the closet yeah yeah, yeah. And, and and that's really the power of the, the digital programs that we're trying to do for safe schools is to not just teach people of that history but also <clears throat> in bring it to them in a way that is that they can absorb it better in a way that is that is quick that is fun that is you know, very, very accessible to everybody and for those that want to check out more of our programs you can go to our youtube channel at safe schools 1991 
and uh, and yeah, and you'll see to and with Eddie. You'll see no this paywall, program. right? No paywall. No paywall. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's all free. Yeah, you'll see <laughs> Tiffany explains it out. You see the tea with Eddie. You'll see this this program in the future and the previous ones that we've done. And we have some other stuff that we're planning too. So we just we, we've just gotten started with what we're doing at Safe Schools. It's yeah. great. So as we look to the future of media literacy, we're peering into a digital landscape that's continually evolving and maturing. The road ahead is undoubtedly challenging, but it's also full of possibilities for proactive change. We are at the cusp of an era where artificial intelligence is becoming increasingly sophisticated. Technologies like deepfakes, mm. where AI is used to create hyper-realistic but entirely fictitious video and audio content, are on the rise. Misinformation campaigns are also becoming more advanced, using psychological tactics and leveraging social networks to spread falsehoods at unprecedented speed and scale. These developments necessitate a parallel evolution in our approach to media literacy. We must stay ahead of the curve, continually updating our toolkit of strategies to identify and debunk misinformation. As technology grows more advanced, so too must our skills in discerning the validity of the information we consume. In addition, it's crucial to foster a culture of critical thinking and open dialogue, encouraging young learners to question, to verify, to discuss and debate is perhaps our most potent weapon against the tide of misinformation. This involves not just teaching the technical skills, but also fostering an attitude of skepticism and curiosity. While the task may seem daunting, it's essential to remember that we are not alone in this fight. Across the globe, individuals, communities, schools, and organizations are joining forces to combat misinformation and foster media literacy. The more we work together, sharing resources and strategies, the more robust our collective defense becomes. But most importantly, we need to remember that our students are not just passive consumers of information. They are active participants in the digital world. They can be change makers and leaders in the fight against misinformation. As educators, our role is not only to guide and support them, but also to learn from them, for they often have their fingers on the pulse of the latest trends and challenges in the digital realm. With that in mind, I'd like to end my portion with a question for our panelists. We've talked about the challenges and opportunities the future holds, but I'm curious about your perspective. How do you see your role as a digital citizen in navigating and shaping the future of media literacy? What ideas do you have to combat misinformation and how educators better support young people in this endeavor? <laughs> no, I, was, I was just gonna say that um, I know I've, I've, I'm much more confident today uh, with young people today in, in terms of how they receive the news mm -hmm. and how they receive information. Uh, I know that the state and here, right here in Florida, they're trying to suppress information. They don't want to teach things that other people feel are not appropriate for. And what began up to the third grade now is the entire public school education. But, you know, young people today have access. They have their phones. They have ways of communicating with each other that didn't exist. And, you know, I think most young people, they'll be able to get past what's not being given to them yeah. in school. And, and they'll be able to get the information that they need or communicate with people who they can trust mm -hmm. much more easily. Yeah, because to your point, like it might not be getting taught in Florida, but it might be getting taught in New England and New York and California. And these students are all online and sharing with each other and sharing the truth with each other. Yeah. In terms of a kind of a, from the perspective of an educator and a media consumer myself, right? I think um, staying in the know and then helping to make others aware of how, you know, wh where the money is, like, right? Yeah. Who's, yeah. who's making this content and for what purpose? And a lot of them is for entertainment, you know, but I mm -hmm. still feel people, I still hear people say, uh, why does YouTube have ads? If you don't understand why YouTube have ads, <laughs> ads right? <laughs> then you need to understand, like, you know, th this is free content for you that somebody is putting out and paying for for a reason, right? right. Yeah. And so as new platforms arise, there's always, you know, good and bad that comes from them. 
but for people to understand who's behind them and who's uh, who's who's putting together that content, how are they reaching you? How do how does it even come to your timeline? You is, know, it yeah. feed? is it ethical? Yeah. Is it ethical? Yeah. What right. Doing? And um, and you know we are in probably the most free market media market um, in the world <laughs> here, yeah. Yeah. right? Um, with with very little um, intervention. So yeah, it's a, I don't you know I, I don't think it's about yeah. suppressing content, even the ones we don't agree with. Right. It's yeah. about really yeah. p making people know that part of being a media consumer is understanding who's who's yeah. given you that. So, well, yeah. to, you know, to quote Spider Man, with that freedom <laughs> comes great responsibility, <laughs> and I think that we we have to demand accountability, accountability. from these yeah. platforms, but also from our elected ourselves. officials, but ourselves our, and our elected yeah. officials. For them to understand what is happening in the ever evolving world of media and and what's happening with digital with digital um uh, yeah. the evolution of digital 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 markets and it was really rough for me to see when when um our elected officials were uh asking questions to facebook when oh, the whole oh, thing yeah. with, mm -hmm. the, with the misinformation campaigns happened and they wanted to understand like why did we allow this to happen right. and facebook you know the people the uh, the people Mark Zuckerberg Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg and the, was like in the congressional yeah, hearing yeah trying to explain to them they're all like you know they, they just they it just glosses over because they don't understand, they don't understand. what's yeah, right. happening and that's why the whole tiktok thing kind of it kind of like it it really did bother me because i feel like their aggression towards tiktok has little to do with what tiktok is doing and and it has more to do with who owns TikTok. Yeah. Because all of a sudden, like, because China is the one that released TikTok, now you're all over TikTok. But what happened when Facebook was doing it, when Twitter was sure. doing it? Yeah. You know, it can go back to MySpace. And, like, how, how, what about the, the stressors of the top eight, you know, of, of your friends? That that's something that we have yeah. that we continue and, and and it's just gotten worse in many times in many in many. Right, but we're responsible for so much of that because you know we all wanted something that was free, right? And all we had to do was click that they we agreed to the terms. <laughs> oh gosh! Yeah. And no, uh, yes, who would read all of that? I mean, yeah. you know, because nobody reads that. We still, yeah. it's like, oh, it's three pages of terms. Oh, it must be, you know, I just, I don't have time, but we agreed and we sold all of our personal information mm -hmm. yeah. for access yep. okay. to be able to share pictures of our cats. <laughs> <laughs> Something so simple. <laughs> and just really quickly, because I feel like we're talking about toolkits, right? So like tools of like challenging misinformation or media literacy. You mentioned something earlier about, you know, America being a free market and how that influences our media. Um, another tool that students could potentially use is look at the media in other countries. What oh yeah. gosh, yes. what is Britain reporting about America? What's the what, BBC saying? Yeah, what does the oh, BBC say about what's going yeah. on, right? Yeah. So um, listening, again, expanding your worldview, listening to others um, is key. Yeah, I'm a big supporter yeah. of the BBC. I, <laughs> I, I go because they, you go onto the BBC and then you see like, the entire world. You go into New York Times, and no one is talking about the Af Africa. When the when, when they started to have that coup in Africa, the first place I went to was the New York Times. Nothing. It was in the BBC. I had to go to the BBC wow. to read mm -hmm. about it, which is kind of like it's kind of like annoying. Like, yes, America, we right. we think that we're the one, the best in the world, but it's like no, like and how we're, funny we're hyper connected. Yeah, you have a yeah. paywall within your own country, but you can freely access BBC. Right. That's sure. interesting. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Right. That's. There's so many good conversations going <laughs> off, but uh, I'm going to say from an influencer standpoint, I think it's even more important because, yes, do I say that there are a lot of young people now more willing to step up to the mm -hmm. plate of talking and pointing out like, hey, this is not okay. Like, actually, I don't agree with that. That's amazing. But there's still a lot of kids who are more reserved, mm -hmm. who know they can't voice their whole opinions. And so they'll look to influencers because they're like, okay, I can't do this thing, but I'm going to live vicariously through this person that I see on social media and who eventually like just influences their lives. But as my job as an influencer, it's not only just, um, you know, with working with Harold of getting that information out there and being like, hey, did you know that this has that correlation? And like, there's that representation of LGBT in this like matter subject, but also giving them a voice and being like it's okay if you can't come out right now because yeah. there's even adults who can't come out right now yeah. or yeah. you know but i think the underlining thing that i've noticed is that i've gone to enough rallies and i've met a lot of queer youth and i do have occasionally the young um 
the young ones that are like, they'll go straight up to me and be like, oh my God, I love your makeup. But I have had more times than I can count off the back of my hand of people like quietly coming up to yeah. me, be like, I think you're so amazing. And I'm like, you're, you have the same qualities as I do. Like, I know maybe you don't feel like that right now, but you have that quality. Yeah. And if my existence and my confidence mm -hmm. can help you through and maybe inspire you later on, that's great. And also being on top of everything on media. I mean, recently we just dealt with the the SAG and WGA mm -hmm. and talking about that. And I immediately brought that up to Harold. And I was like, we need to say something. I know we're not a union, but this is important because mm -hmm. this is just the the precipice of yeah. what's coming like down the line. Yeah. And we need to be on top of that. And if we say something misinformation, I want to make sure that we also like be able to retract and put out a statement or put out a video be like, hey, we posted this and there was some misinformation yeah. and holding ourselves to that yep. accountability. Yep. Sure. Yep. And I think anyone can be an influencer. Yes. Point. Like you don't need social media to go out and influence somebody and be yep. a mentor to somebody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that kind of piggybacks off of a question I want to ask both oh. you and Harold about how do you see safe schools role in misinformation in the future and how can you all help um, consumers of information and as creators of information yeah so this this whole program actually is is part of our attempts to um teach people teach not just kids but also teachers and professionals on what is coming what what is already here and how and how can it and how it will expand and impact your life i think that you, uh, you mentioned earlier that when the internet first came out, Steve, that um, reporters were afraid of it. Reporters were, you know, sure. very much in, in fear of it. Mm -hmm. And I think we're seeing the same thing when it comes to artificial intelligence. Yeah. We see that there's all this aggression towards it. And there's all this, you know, it's going to destroy the world. It's going to um, become the Terminator, whatever. Right. The, no, or Skynet. The, uh, Skynet. <laughs> yeah. And that's going to be the end of the world. And it's like, in many ways... It is going to be the end of the world because it's going to be the end of our world as we understand it today and birth a whole new world right. where mm -hmm. these tools are tools and not um, something, to be feared. something to be feared. Right. Right. And, and that is why at Safe Schools, we are really just leaning into the future and being like, guys, you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to you know, pretend it doesn't exist. Here it is. Here's how to better use it. Here's how to ethically use it. Ethically. Because we yeah. know that our technological advancements are always 10 steps ahead of how we know how to use them ethically. Right. So yeah. let's 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 bring the ethics up to where we are and, and instead of like shaming these tools or saying, look, don't use these tools, these tools are, are evil or awful, being like, how can we better learn? Mm -hmm. How can you learn how to use this? How can you learn how to use these chatbots to you know, set up your set up your research or find more information about what you're doing, but still learn how to write, learn how to create your own thoughts. Critical thinking. Critical thinking. Yeah, this yeah. this won't do it for you. It's gonna get close to doing it for you, but you eventually you're gonna know that this is not this is not the person that's doing it. Yeah. And also, we're using our platform, we're using our website to give people the information that they are being told they can no longer access. Mm -hmm. So we are retooling our website to have. I mean, most of our blogs are are talking to counter to what the, to what the government wants you to hear, but not the government, but, but you know, there are certain groups of people are wanting <laughs> you to, to hear. Um, we want, if they're telling you you can't learn AP physics, uh, AP oh. psychology, oh. Uh, come come to our website and we'll show yeah. you where you can get access to that information. You can learn about African American studies, come to our website and we'll show you about, you know, what, what you're not learning. Because this is not, and the thing is that because it's online, it's not only helping our kids, but it's helping kids across the world. Yeah, sure. yeah. And that is why nonprofits have to step up and mm -hmm. be be that 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 lighthouse, be that beacon of digital hope for people who are from countries that don't have access to the freedoms that we have in this country mm -hmm. that we have to protect, that we have to hold close to because mm -hmm. we are living in a time that things are changing so rapidly that people feel overwhelmed at times. Yeah. And that overwhelmness, uh, you know, that anxiety that pro that is produced from, from that makes them disconnect. And that's not good because we will lose it. We will lose this great experiment yes. if we don't step up yeah, right. and mobilize and form those intersectional connections with uh, people who are marginalized, the same as we are, and say, 
We may not agree on this, but we agree on all of this. Let's work on this while sitting in the uncomfortable space of like not agreeing on this one thing. Mm -hmm. Eventually, we'll get to it and we'll we'll talk about it. Yeah. But guys, let's let's work on not losing this amazing place that we call no. the United States. I, yeah. Absolutely, and what you're talking about really needs to be reinforced because there are still many people who feel that if they do raise a different issue or a different perspective, they're going to be shamed. Right. right. And we do that ourselves. Yes. Mm -hmm. We shame our community. And, and, and you know, and it's, it's really difficult to talk about this because I have, I, I like, I, I like, like Dan over here, we're, we're both listeners and I like to listen to people. And the more you listen, the more you, 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 you lean into what they're saying, they'll start to Reveal, you know, reveal, reveal what's, what, what's yeah. really happening with them. Yeah. And I've had people that I would never guess are like, I, I really struggle with the trans issue. And I'm like, thank you for telling me that. Yeah. You know, let, let's talk about why you struggle. And then they'll list out what yeah. other things that they have heard. I and mean, I'm like, look, this is actually not really happening. Like, this is what's actually happening. And I, and I welcome you to do more research about it yeah. because not in, they're, they're not putting... A cat litter, and like yeah, <laughs> like or, or like or like or, or like an eighteen-year-old, fully presenting male is not all of a sudden becoming a female right. gym, yeah. gymnast, like whatever it is, you know, like, yeah. that's not how that works, you know. Learn, mm -hmm. learn how things actually work. But thank you for telling me, like. But that takes the willingness from the person that you're engaging conversation. Like you identify that you yourself are a good listener. But it also is reliant on the person with whose views are being challenged, like. If if you wanna if you are agreeing to enter this conversation, you also need to reciprocate being a good listener, right? right? So like, if you are willing to be challenged, if you are gonna ask the questions, be willing to listen. Yeah. Yeah. To yes. Absolutely. absolutely. Yes. Well, I think that's a good place for us to pause <laughs> and move on to our next segment. So, from reflections on the past to projections for the future, our journey today has been enlightening. Now it's time for us to hear from you. What questions do you have? What comments or ideas would you like to share? You can leave your thoughts in the comments below or send us an email at roundtable at safeschoolssouthflorida.org. And that brings us to the end of another engaging and enlightening episode of the Safe Schools Rainbow Roundtable. We hope that today's discussion has given you new insights, sparked your curiosity, and empowered you with the tools to make a positive change in your classrooms and communities. Remember, the journey of learning and growth doesn't stop here. We encourage you to delve deeper into these topics, to ask questions, to start conversations, and to become active participants in building a more inclusive and educated society. To ensure you never miss an episode of the Rainbow Roundtable, please follow and subscribe to Safe Schools on our social media, at Safe Schools 1991. We'll continue to bring you insightful discussions expert perspectives, and practical resources to navigate the diverse challenges and opportunities in our educational landscape. A big thank you to our partners at Happening Out Television Network for their unwavering support and commitment to this endeavor. We appreciate the fostering inclusive conversations and their drive to amplify the voices that need to be heard. Hotspots Magazine Happening Out Television Network is one of the largest nonprofit 501c3 LGBTQ plus media platforms in the world. Their mission is dedicated to their 10 pillars of the LGBTQ plus community, including black community, Latino, lesbian and queer women, trans, HIV AIDS healthcare, seniors, business, social justice, and faith. Safe Schools falls into the, tenth, uh, the media company's 10th pillar to support students and youth. And finally, a heartfelt thanks to our panelists today. Your expertise, experience, and passion truly make the Rainbow Roundtable the vibrant and impactful space that it is. As we wrap up today, let's remember that every color in the rainbow is unique, but together they create a beautiful spectrum. The same goes for our diverse experiences and perspectives. It's in our unity and diversity that makes us stronger, that builds bridges of understanding, and lights the way towards a brighter future. So keep shining, keep questioning, and most importantly, keep adding your unique color to our shared rainbow. Remember, a world full of color is a world full of possibilities. With what's happening in our schools, to our teachers, school boards, and especially our students, 
We hope you will support our nonprofit mission, Stand Up and Educate Our Community. We ask you to support Safe Schools' mission in sharing, voicing support, volunteering, and financial support to propel our mission. That is why we invite you to tune in next month for another round of enriching conversation. Until then, stay curious, stay informed, and stay safe. Remember, in diversity, there's understanding, in understanding, there's unity, and in unity, there's hope. I'll see you next time.